During our last talk, you mentioned precision stress was another active area of study at your university. Talk to us about the recent precision stress findings. Precision stress has long been known to be valuable in agriculture. Um, and I, I've always used the line, a, a little stress is, in, 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 let's take an analogy to people. A little stress is really good for people. It's just that you don't want to have too much. And so we live our lives. If the, the a life worth living has a little stress in it, <laughs> just not too much at the wrong times. And um, a life with no stress, I guess that goes back to Stoc Socrates or something. A life with no stress is not worth living, something like that. I'm paraphrasing what he said, but, it, but people get the point. Um, and so we push ourselves to be on the edge of going crazy with, but because it gets us out of bed in the morning to go to work. So the same thing with plants. Um, we now can grow plants with no stress at all. And of course, they're big and lush and floppy and often low nutrient value, but they grow super fast. But they're not even that good for people. And then the tiniest bit of stress wipes them out. They're just not acclimated to any stress. So we've only had the ability to do that in, in recent years as we got better LEDs with higher light. Um, so we've long used, one of the great applications of precision stress has been water stress. And we have evidence that a little bit of water stress, as you might expect, makes sugar content go up in fruits. Now, fruits includes grapes. And that is really commercially valuable to have higher sugar content in grapes. Um, it, it's worth billions of dollars. So we've tried to get the right amount of stress so sugar goes up in grapes without reducing yield. And it's super challenging, but it's possible. And that research is ongoing. We've, we've not done grapes in my lab, but, but I work closely with people that have. We've also done precision water stress of things like uh, peaches and cherries. Um, Utah is a big cherry producing state and trying to get sugar content up in cherries. Um, and it's possible, but it's tricky to, to monitor. So we bring in all our fancy instruments and try and just give them a little stress. And it's in real time too. We're monitoring the tree and a little bit more, a little bit less. So it's a holy grail of agriculture is to get precision stress to improve quality. Uh, and I, I know it's there, we, we just, but it's tricky. Um, so this relates to all crops. Um, the little, and, and water stress is huge in this regard. And that's very hard to do in containers with soilless media because they're not gradual release of water. You can have a soilless media that has plenty of water, and then two hours later, the plant's wilted. I mean, it just goes from ample water to wilted real fast, unlike soil in the field, which is gradual water stress. So then we add salt, and sometimes sodium chloride, and sometimes other things, calcium, magnesium, and to try and create osmotic stress, and this is common in the world of medical hemp, uh, osmotic stress to improve quality and bringing in that some parts of the life cycle and not others. Um, in our work here, it's that's a little bit like UV light. It's It's been difficult to enhance quality with precision osmotic stress. I didn't say impossible, it's very difficult. <laughs> Um, and yet people work on it hard and some growers swear by it. They, they just say, I'm, I'm sure that's helping me. I'm going to do precision osmotic stress. And we've got lots of sensors so you can turn the dials and get a little more and a little less. Um, but when we try to do it in controlled studies, it's been difficult. Usually what we end up doing is decreasing yield without an increase in, in quality. Uh, so it's challenging, but that's a, a novel area of precision stress. 
UV light is an example of precision stress. Plants don't like that UV light. They're making, and plants are just amazing. If you go outside without sunscreen, you get sunburned. A plant goes outside and synthesizes its own sunscreen. It synthesizes pigments that block the UV light. And, and that's why if you put plants outside, they might get sunburned for a few days and then they synthesize UV blockers and then they're okay. Um, but that's a precision stress for UV light. Um, water stress is big. Um, one of the areas we've been working on is precision nutrient stress and not high, high stress, not osmotic stress with high salinity, low nutrients to help keep the plants more compact and especially low phosphorus. Um, we know that low phosphorus can help floriculture plants um, reduce stem elongation and be nice compact plants. Um, and so we take that same concept to other crops like medical hemp and say, if we go to low phosphorus, can we keep the plants more compact? And the answer is pretty promising. I mean, I think that we, there's good potential to reduce stem elongation with precision phosphorus stress. And when I say stress, I mean irrigation with like 10 to 12 parts per million phosphorus, not necessarily zero, but often people put on more than 50 parts per million phosphorus. And our studies just show that. We've never been able to show that helps. That's at the high end of phosphorus, but that's some of our, couple of our recent published papers um, are on phosphorus nutrition. And I've get, I just gave a talk at Southern Illinois University a few weeks ago. Of the many things I talked about, I chose to talk about using precision phosphorus stress to keep plants short, and then the dangers of high phosphorus, mainly because of the environment. I mean, phosphorus is a very, it causes algal blooms, and, and it's, a, it's a toxic element. All of agriculture needs to be very careful about applying phosphorus so we don't pollute the environment. And many medical hemp growers are egregiously over fertilized with phosphorus. Hopefully, we write scientific papers and say, be careful in, in your application of this element um, because it's got big, big environmental consequences. I've heard about the over application of phosphorus, and it seems like over the years, recent years, that uh, a lot of these companies have kind of reduced the amount of phosphorus putting that, that they're putting into their nutrient regimens. So that's good to see. Now, how about wind stress? Wind stress is something that anecdotally for me seems to make a difference. Now, I'm talking small scale in a tent, having the same genetics throughout the tent, the plants on the front where there is wind on it more have visibly more trichome productions than the plants in the back. Is there any data to suggest that at all? Yes, yes, there is. Um, it doesn't come from medical hemp, it comes from plants in the field. If you take a plant with minimal wind, it's never, the wind's never really zero. And in, and in a controlled environment, to, to sound fancy, we call it air velocity, but it's wind, same thing. The plant has got a lush environment and the stems can elongate quite quickly. But now if you start to jiggle the plant, it adapts to that and it makes a more stocky, shorter, stiffer stem. So there is good evidence for that. Now, commercially, we try to give the plants plenty of wind to keep the air well mixed, um, blow the humidity away, reduce mold counts. So we put in all kinds of fans um, to, to mix the air, but, but maybe we could be mixing it even more to help reduce plant height. But then that, again, that starts to come at a cost because you got to pay for the electricity to make those fans. A rule of thumb is if you buy an instrument to measure wind, an anemometer, one meter per second, a, a meter per second of wind is just enough to make leaves flutter. And I always say, if your leaves are fluttering, that's near optimum. If they're not moving, you should get more wind. 
if they're doing this, that maybe is too much wind, but they should be moving. And that's easy to see. Um, so you should try to get enough fans to make a move. But in your case, you have more aggressive movement and it help, It looks like it helped keep the plant shorter. So I, I, I don't, you're you're appropriately cautious scientifically. It's an observation, and then you say, "Is there any mechanism behind this?" But there is a mechanism. We we know plants make st shorter, stockier stems when they're subjected to even shaking them does that on a on a shaker table. So we we know there's a mechanism there. Whether that's economically viable, I don't know. Could you could you have super high wind to keep the plant shorter? Maybe. This clip is brought to you by Vivo Sun. Use discount code Mr. Grow15 to save on any of their gardening products. Go to the full episode by clicking the outro card here or click the link in the description section below. Catch you in the next video.